Hello, booktube. I have a bunch of mail, a bunch of packages on the front porch when I got back from the long walk with the bean. Uh, and it, that's good because you noticed our streak ended. We, we went a day without any mail at all, and I expect more of those. But, uh, but there's a lot of stuff here, and I have the suspicion that some of these things may be things that I ordered just a million years ago. I'm hoping that it's that, and not that it's things that you ordered, <laughs> because you shouldn't be ordering books for me. <laughs> uh, but first, I think there are a couple here that are just straight up from the publisher, uh, which is great. It's always great to see. I always, you know, forlornly hope that that will increase, that it will pop back up to, to uh, frequency instead of just disappearing completely. Uh, oh, 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 wonderful. Oh, fantastic. Okay, this is... Uh, has a date, a pub date on the sheet of late of late May, uh, and I bet that that it is one of those. I bet that will actually be true because this is a finished copy. I don't know where it's going to be sold. I guess there are parts of the country where the retail bookstores are open. Are your bookstores? If you're in America, are your bookstores open? If, like maybe they can have th three customers in at a time or something like that. I in Massachusetts we are still I think a long way off from that, but. The states in the in in the United States that haven't been swamped yet by this, that haven't been hit hard by this pandemic, may think they're immune. They're of course not. <laughs> they're of course not. Every hour of every day, people are coming into that state who are infected. There is this, that's not how this is going to work <laughs> at all. If you if you have a kiddie pool and you bring over the garden hose and you turn the garden hose on and you point it down at the kiddie pool and you just let her rip. Uh, the first little indentation of the kiddie pool is going to fill right away, but water is going to be spilling, droplets are going to be flying, other parts are going to start to fill after that. And the idea that some people in Trump states in this country are thinking that they're not going to experience gigantic industry shutting spikes in this virus is the same idea as if the person pouring water into that kiddie pool thought that the parts that weren't hit, that weren't filled with water immediately would never get filled. <laughs> That's exactly the kind of thinking that, okay, the point directly underneath the, the, the hose is now full of water. That part over there, there's no water at all there, so that's good to go there. <laughs> it's, the, it's just that kind of idiotic thinking to think that, that if you're spared so far, you're going to be spared. The, the hotspots are, are entry points for this country. That's why they are the way they are. That's why they've been hotspots in the first place. You can just look and see where people enter this country. And that will be an exact map of the hotspots for this virus. But people travel. People move around. And if they don't, infected items do. So, <laughs> But in the meantime, the delusion propagated by the President of the United States is that this is a patchwork quilt type thing and that some places will just be spared. Uh, and so in those places... Are, are your bookstores open? Are your bookstores open in Oklahoma? In Wyoming? In Montana? Uh, so th if they are, this book will be there, I would imagine, in late May. This is a romance novel. Uh, this is by Anna Bennett. I have, I'm looking at my romance bookcase here. I have a bunch of Anna Bennett. I know that I do. I think I have everything uh, that she's written, but I would have to, I'd have to dig for it, so we won't do that. This is When You Wish Upon a Rogue. Uh, part of the Debutante Diary series. Lovely thing with our heroine. And there is a stately home in the background. Uh, and this is the conclusion of the Debutante Diary series. Oh, I remember liking a couple of these. I want this to end. Uh, Miss Sophie Kendall is happiest arranging the secret meetings of the Debutante Underground, a group of women who come together to discuss the weekly advice column, The Debutante's Revenge. What makes Sophie most unhappy is her impending march down the aisle to a man she does not love. But her family's finances are in increasingly dire straits. Henry Reese, the Earl of Warshire, hasn't slept in weeks. Desperate to escape his manor house and its haunting memories, he heads for one of his abandoned London properties. There he meets a beautiful, intriguing woman, trespassing. Reese is far less interested in Sophie's search for a secret meeting spot than he is in her surprising ability to soothe his demons. So he strikes a bargain with her, his shop, in exchange for spending one night a week with him. Sophie never expected this to happen, but she cannot deny the fire Reese sparks in her. And maybe, and soon their shared desire burns bright. Sophie is irrevocably promised to another, but maybe these two ill-fated lovers can find a way to risk it all, all the way to happily ever after. <laughs> classic. What classic uh, modern Regency romance, and modern in the sense of, uh, 
I feel fairly certain that when they're meeting once a week, they're not talking about literature. So, and that's just the way of modern Regency romances, is that what you, that's what you get. You get, uh, they're full-blooded, let's just put it that way. <laughs> Most of them are, some of them not. Uh, it doesn't, it's always done with, uh, with taste and wit, so I don't really mind. That is fantastic. A romance to beguile my evening, that is great. That goes right on the front of the list. And then we've got this other thing, great big thing. Could be, could be a finished copy. And then we'll deal with the, the anomalous packages, the packages that, uh, where I, I don't know what they are. Uh, I don't know what this is either, but, uh, oh my, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, I have heard of this thing. I just assumed I'd be getting an, an electronic copy. I didn't think I'd get the physical one from Farrar's Trusted Giroux. Fantastic, oh my. Okay, uh, I have been looking forward to this. Great, I got a physical copy. Okay, this is, is slated for the beginning of June, and this is a finished copy, so it could come out in the beginning of June. And it'd be, it'd be reprise my question all over again. Where are you getting your books? I wonder if Amazon would send you a physical copy of this thing if you asked for it, if you didn't order the, the ebook. I wonder if they've eased up enough so that they would send you this. Uh, well, one way or another, fantastic. This is by Eric Cervini. And this is the Deviance War, the homosexual versus the United States of America. A big, a big work. Uh, well, let, let, me, let me read you about it here. In 1957, Frank Kameny, a rising astronomer working for the U.S. Department of Defense in Hawaii, received a summons to report immediately to Washington, D.C. The Pentagon had reason to believe he was a homosexual. And after a series of humiliating interviews, Kameny, like countless gay men and women before him, was promptly dismissed from his government job. Unlike many others, though, he fought back. Uh, Eric Cervini's The Deviance War is the story of what followed. That book is, this book is an assiduously researched history of an early champion of gay liberation who fought for the right to follow his passion and serve his country in the wake of Joe McCarthy's Lavender Scare, the, uh, the famous communist witch hunt, the Red Scare that Joe McCarthy led to disgraceful extents and suicides uh, among his enemies uh, is the most famous part of his campaign, but the, the, um, a far more damaging part was the so-called Lavender Scare, where he went after suspected homosexuals for a whole bunch of psychological reasons that had very little to do. The, the standard line at the time that McCarthy pushed and his allies pushed was that since homosexuality was illegal and clandestine and scorned, if you were one and you were in a, a position of responsibility in the United States government, you were extra susceptible to bribery, to uh, extortion. Uh, I don't believe that that was McCarthy's main reason, but, but that was what he said. Uh, let's see here. We follow Kameny as he explores the underground gay scenes of Boston and Washington, D.C., where he formulates his arguments against the U.S. government's classification of gay men and women as, quote, sexual perverts. At a time when staying in the closet remained the default. He exposed the hypocrisies of the American establishment, accelerated a broader revolution in sexual morals, and invented what we know as gay pride. <clears throat> Based on first-hand accounts, recently declassified FBI records, and 40,000 personal documents. Good Lord. Now I want to know about the author. We'll find out about the author. That's a huge amount. That's a huge thing. The Deviance War unfolds over the course of the 1960s <clears throat> as the Mattachine Society of Washington the group Kameny founded, became the first organization to protest the systematic persecution of gay federal employees. It traces the forgotten ties that bound gay rights to the black freedom movement, the new left, lesbian activism, and trans resistance. Above all, it is the story of America and Washington at a cultural and sexual crossroads, of shocking Byzantine public battles with Congress, of FBI informants, murder, betrayal, sex, love, and ultimately victory. Good Lord. Okay, so this has uh, praise from Publishers Weekly. Uh, and let's see, other, other, uh, lots of gay authors as well. Yeah, it's kind of comes with, loaded with blurbs, is, is the point here. It comes loaded with blurbs, so let's see here. E Eric Cervini is an award-winning historian of LGBTQ plus culture and politics. He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College and received his Ph.D. in history from the University of Cambridge, where he was a Gates Scholar. He is the host of the Deviance World podcast and of Quarantini, an LGBTQ plus book and movie club, 
that he started while in quarantine. And this is his debut book. And this is our author. Uh, fantastic. So he's young. Uh, yeah, that is that is a slightly better picture. That is our author. I don't do podcasts. Do any of you know Quarantini? Uh, the I'm being punched and being... Could you settle down? I'm trying to talk to your fans. Do you want to see them? We're talking about... We're talking about this book. Hmm? Get the lick of approval? <laughs> what are you doing, baby? What are you doing? I'm talking to my imaginary booktube friends. I do this every day. You know that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, well, this is all the more impressive for being his first book. That's fantastic. All right, so I'm going to double check. I'm going to double check with the publicist uh, <clears throat> and make sure that this actually is slated for June. Uh, and I will read it right away. So that's great. The two new books that I got are things that I'm going to read tonight. That's fantastic. That's almost a, a taste of old times. Uh, and now, speaking of old times, let's look at these other books. We have a couple of boxes and a manila envelope. Let's look at these things and see what they are. These had better not be presents from the rest of you, because that has gone on way too much. That... <laughs> Everything's going to heck in a hand. That's good here. All right, so what have we got here? What is this? What is this? Uh, okay. All right. Uh, this is, I think, a gift from one of you. This is... Oh, how wonderful. Oh. Okay, I mentioned the other day, I've mentioned a few times on this channel, that I have a small handful of books that I compulsively reread. I love them so, so much that I reread them all the time. I know them so well that rereading them is really not reading. I already know what's in them. And this is one of them, and I guess maybe one of you remembered. <laughs> maybe one of you remembered that I, oh, these are beautiful. I hope these weren't expensive. Good Lord. One of you got me the Jungle Books. And the second Jungle Books. It's the Jungle Books, Volume 1 and Volume 2. In these editions, these are by Doubleday, and they have uh, color plates, but also uh, black and white plates as well. <laughs> In their dust jackets, how incredibly nice! I... Uh, look at these things, they're the rains, the rains over the jungle. How incredible! This is the first and second Jungle Books. In unbelievable what <laughs> I don't have this set I don't actually have many copies of the Jungle Books unlike a lot of the other books that I compulsively reread Sherlock Holmes Moby Dick Lord of the Rings in all of, a lot of those cases I have multiple copies I just love experiencing them in different copies but with Jungle Books I just have one I don't even have the old Reader's Digest hardcover of Jungle Books anymore I just have the Penguin Classic that's all until now now I have, I have this incredible Incredible. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Let's uh, let's see what this next one is. I hope these all aren't presents from from you people because this is that's rather excessively generous. Uh, let's let's see what this next one is. What is it, baby? What have we got here? Hmm? I, baby, you aren't even finished with this, and you want something else? You want a box? All right, I'll give you a box. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, great. All right, this one is is. Uh, this one is me. <laughs> this one is this one is me. This is this is something I ordered, uh, <clears throat> because I uh, I looked at <clears throat> a big oversized hardcover omnibus of the Avengers, uh, Avengers Omnibus Volume Two, which collects a, a long strand stretch of time when the team was rebuilding, so to speak. So the team originally started out with Thor and Iron Man and the Hulk, and Ant Man and the Wasp. So you had to, to a scientist and his debutante wife who can shrink to penny size. And then you have three of the most powerful beings in the world. And that team lasted very little time. First the Hulk left. And then after a little bit of time, Thor and Iron Man also left. And, and so did Ant-Man and the Wasp. By that time, Captain America had joined the team. 
And he was joined by Hawkeye, the archer, and Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, two mutants. And none of them had enormous amounts of power. None of them did. The Scar this was the, Scar the old days of the Scarlet Witch when she had hex powers that she could only use a little before they exhausted her. And they did little things like making guns explode. They didn't rewrite reality. But one of the things that was amazing about that, that uh, new Avengers team was how good it was. Stan Lee wrote the heck out of that team. I think he always did best when his teams weren't overwhelmingly powerful. And this team of Avengers wasn't overwhelmingly powerful for a long time before Quicksilver learned a particular trick of his powers. The team didn't even have anyone who could fly. They had to... Uh, and, and almost no one with overwhelming physical powers. Uh, the Scarlet Witch was handy in a clutch, but uh, Hawkeye and Captain America didn't have any superpowers. And I loved that era of the team. So when I found that hardcover Avengers Omnibus for like $50, something like that, I got it and loved going through it. Uh, but I, I took it out just the other day, or a, a couple, a few weeks ago, a month ago, and was looking through it again and realized that although I love it, and I love the fact that those Omnibus editions reprint all of the original letters, so that if, by chance, someone from small town Iowa had written a letter to his favorite Marvel comic, it might be in there. <laughs> uh, or, or multiple letters might be in there, in, in the case of Thor volumes. Uh, that as much as I like the, those features, it's, an, uh, it's a cumbersome volume to read. It's not comfortable to read. Uh, and so <laughs> I went and found the uh, the paperback epic collection uh, of one of those, and that's this. This is Avengers Epic. This is Once an Avenger, and there you see the beginnings of the team changing. That is a classic Jack Kirby cover. There you see the uh, quartet that I was talking about. Captain America refounded the team, basically, with a four-person roster. And then gradually that, that roster grew. Uh, Ant-Man came back. Hank Pym only came back as Goliath, as Giant-Man. So that they added a, a very good element of physical power. None of these four are physically strong. Super strong. Uh, you, if you present these four people with uh, a really thick steel door, for instance, if Hawkeye doesn't have his blast arrows, and if the Scarlet Witch's hex doesn't happen to do anything to that door, she doesn't even know what her hexes are going to do, then they're stuck. They can't get past it. Uh, so that was neat to add that on. And this is Don Heck artwork. He does a great, great job. Uh, and this is, uh, this is that. This is a lot of those issues. Uh, I decided that rather than uh, have that omnibus volume and sort of grumble about how I'm in, unwieldy it is, I would just get these paperback volumes because the epic the epic collections these are uh full color reprint paperbacks that marvel does and these epic collections have a tendency to go out of print marvel doesn't just keep them going forever and ever so i i figured while the, while they were there i would get them great fantastic and i will believe it or not reread these <laughs> i will reread these these are the these issues go from captain america and his team uh his quartet uh to goliath joining the team and the wasp rejoining the team and then Hercules, the Greek god Hercules, uh, fresh from the pages of the mighty Thor, joins the team. That was a move I didn't see coming at all <laughs> when I was reading these originally, and I loved it. And of course, Hercules isn't just an element of raw brawn. Stan Lee wrote him as Superman, basically. So he's, he's not just physically strong, he's physically stronger than anybody. <laughs> he's... he's effortlessly more powerful than the whole team put together and that creates a dynamic on its own and I believe he's in these uh, the last few of these issues that are in this volume there we have the issue where Cap's quartet faces off against Doctor Doom but they face off against other people too oh this is going to be fun I will just reread this I don't care that I just reread it I'll reread it again great uh, and then we have uh, this last one uh, another box uh, again no idea if this is something that I ordered or something that you ordered. <laughs> no, I would rather it be something that I ordered. Because you people, as Miss Sainted Ma used to say, you're not made of money. Uh, so let's see what this is. This is carefully wrapped, packed and wrapped. Oh, okay, this is something that I ordered. This has got to be the last of the things I ordered. I don't think there'll be many more of them. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, fantastic. Okay, I mentioned that I, I've been loving uh, science fiction anthologies of short stories. I got a bunch of them uh, until I realized that that ordering books online is a slippery slope. <laughs> Maybe I should ease off. But I did order one other. There's one uh, absolutely classic anthology. Some anthologies, like the Gardner Dozoir anthologies that I showed you that I got online, 
some of them are just are just they're great on their own they're great reading they're a great mix you're following the vision of whoever the editor is that assembled them but other anthologies are actually standalone great works on their own i think you, you probably know what i mean right i mean the, you've got a million poetry anthologies but you've only got one oxford book of english verse one norton book of american verse that sort of thing there are short story collections that are classics on their own apart from uh, they're just they're so good that they become a separate thing I should do a whole video where I try to make sense of what I just said and this is one of them this is one of them this is edited by David Hartwell this is the science fiction century uh, and I found it for pennies online and this is a hardcover that was it's an ex library edition very discreet marking though hardly noticeable at all and it has the library's uh, plastic sheathing on it so that's fantastic. It's just a perfectly new book. That's great. And this is one of those anthologies. This this is a, a, a retrospective of science fiction as it grew over time. And Hartwell is a genius of an editor. He's fantastic at assembling these volumes. He did an, a couple of others. A Scent of Wonder would be another one I'd want to have if I could find it for cheap. But I am so happy to have this because when I was getting all of those science fiction anthologies in the mail, I did that because I... I during the, the earliest, hardest days of quarantine, I was finding a sweet tooth for science fiction short stories, the format in which I fell in love with the genre. And uh, I looked around. <laughs> I've mentioned we we're all playing musical chairs here because we were just frozen in place with whatever we had when quarantine was imposed. And I, well, I looked around, and I assumed that I had, I for the longest time, I had a trade paperback of this. It was in pretty pretty rough condition. I go back to it a lot. And... Uh, for the longest time, I had a trade paperback of it, and I assumed that I still did, but when quarantine was imposed and I looked around for all the short story collections that I have, I noticed that I didn't have this one, and that felt, that felt bad. That really did. Some other anthologies I wouldn't mind so much, but not having this felt like a loss. I've gone back to this many, many times. Uh, so I'm very glad to have it back again, and in a hardcover with a plastic covering on it. That's fantastic. Great. Okay, well, that is our that is our day's mail. That was a great mixture of new, uh, new and old. Uh, so we have Science Fiction Century. Uh, there, you see that it would be in sci-fi in your, in your library. <laughs> we have the, uh, then we have the Avengers Epic Collection, uh, Volume 2. Once an Avenger, always an Avenger. <laughs> uh, then we have a very nice two-volume hardcover set of the Jungle Books. The first Jungle Books and the second Jungle Book. We have the Deviance War. Uh, a full, uh, groundbreaking, it sounds like, uh, for thousands and thousands of original documents, a groundbreaking debut nonfiction account of uh, maybe a little bit forgotten pioneer of gay rights. That is going to be fascinating to read. And notice, I am going to read the new books that are my job. I am not going to sink a lot of time into these bottom two, or this one, God help us. But you, and then, uh, When You Wish Upon a Road, the last of the Debutante Diaries romance novels, and you can see right here that these books are at war with each other because these two are the ones that I should be reading and all of these present enormous active temptations to get away, to go away from the stuff I should be reading and read the stuff I shouldn't be reading. So that war is going to be fought in this little book room tonight. <laughs> but, but anyway, that was fun. That was lots of fun. I'm going to look over all these things. Fantastic. And then I will get to work on the romance novel and the Deviance War. Those need to be read tonight. Uh, but anyway, that is the mail. Fantastic. Let's hope for more tomorrow. <laughs> so I will wrap this up, but I will see you then. Thank you, BookTube.